Chapter 15 They Have Stolen Our Baby Tuesday, March 1st, 1932 At about 8.25 p.m., Charles drove up his narrow, mile-long driveway through darkness and past wind-tossed trees. It had been a longer-than-usual ride from Dr. Carroll's library laboratory blustery wet weather combined with the unpaved country roads leading to their new home had made him late gravel skittered under his tires as the Hopewell house came into view the Lindbergh's is new ten-room two-story structure made of whitewashed field stone lacked the grandeur of the Marles' estate next day hill but every inch belonged to him and Anne and it felt safe the couple had grown so comfortable they rarely closed their curtains at night they'd even fired the guard who once stood at the gate so far the Lindberg's had stayed here only on weekends arriving Saturday afternoons and leaving Monday mornings but this past weekend had been different. Little Charlie had come down with a cold. When the family awoke to sheeting rain that Monday, Charles insisted they stay another night. Why take the feverish, sniffling baby out into the damp? Anne had agreed. Telephoning next day Hill, she met, she let her mother know there'd been a change in plans. Then she spent the day rocking and cuddling the baby and rubbing Vic's ointment on his chest. She hoped to return to her mother's house on Tuesday. The next morning, although Charlie felt better, Anne had awoken a scratchy throat with a scratchy tho throat and runny nose. Looking out at the damp day, she decided to call next day Hill and ask the chauffeur to drive Betty Gow to the Hopewell house. Charles had approved of her decision. Not many people knew it yet. But Anne was three months pregnant. Now he honked his horn to alert the staff, then drove around to the garage. Inside the house, Ollie What Ollie the butler and his wife, Elsie, the housekeeper, got up from their chairs in the servants' sitting room and went into the kitchen to finish preparing the Lindbergh's dinner. They left Betty behind to finish her meal alone. Charles found her three there moments later 
He asked after Buster. He felt much better. Betty reported. She recounted how the rascally toddler had galloped into the sitting room a few hours earlier, babbling and pointing and chasing the family's fox terrier, Wagush, named after Charles's childhood dog. Still, as a precaution against the cold return, Charlie had been put to bed with a layer of chest ointment. Betty had even made a little undershirt earlier that evening from an old flannel petticoat. She had put it on beneath the baby's pajamas so the ointment wouldn't stain. The 20-month-old had been sleeping safe and sound for almost an hour since 7.30. Satisfied, Charles went into the living room where Anne, curled in the corner of the sofa, notebook in hand, he was glad to see her writing. Putting words on paper he knew was her lifeline. Lately she'd begun forming her notes about their flight to China into a narrative narrative she hoped might grow into a book. On seeing her husband, Anne closed her notebook. The two chatted for a few minutes, then went in to dinner. Afterward, they returned to the living room. Sitting beside the fireplace, there they were sharing the events of their days when Charles's head suddenly jerked up. What was that? He'd heard a splintering noise, like the slats of a wooden box falling to the floor. Anne shook her head. She hadn't heard a thing. A few minutes later, exhausted from her cold and caring for Charlie, she went upstairs to bathe and read, and Charles went into his study after settling into his desk chair. He opened a biology book. It was 10 p.m. when Betty Gow burst in on him. Colonel Lindbergh, have you got the baby? She cried, have you got the baby? Isn't he in his crib? No. Leaping up, Charles took the stairs three at a time to the nursery. In the crib he found nothing but the imprint of his son's head on the pillow. On the window sill he saw an envelope. Grasping the implications instantly, he brushed past Anne, who stood frozen in the doorway, and charged into their bedroom. He grabbed a rifle from the closet. Back in the nursery, he stood over the empty crib, the gun clenched in his hands and he said they have stolen our baby 
Charles strode downstairs to his study and telephoned the police. Then, still holding his rifle, he went out into the night. He would have taken a flashlight if there had been any in the house. Instead, he searched with only the glow from the windows illuminating his way around back directly below Charlie's window he discovered footprints not far from there he found a homemade ladder in three parts later in the daylight he would see that one of its side rails was broken and would remember the unusual splintering sound he'd heard could that have been the cause nearby lay a carpenter's chisel he assumed was used to pry open the nursery window. Charles started off toward the woods, but the pitch blackness stopped him. As he turned back, he heard someone shouting the baby's name. It was Anne. She'd flung open their bedroom window and was leaning out into the night, eyes wide, ears straining for her son's cries. Her head swiveled in the direction of the wood pile. What was that noise? Only a cat, the housekeeper, Elsie, what a... Lee said she led Anne from the window and Charles touching none of the evidence he'd found returned to the house the local police arrived a little before 11 p.m followed by the New Jersey State Troopers commanded by Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, a barrel-chested man wearing a tailored suit instead of a uniform. After displaying the, the badge he carried in his wallet, he asked for the details. For details. Charles showed him the evidence he'd found on the grounds, then led a group of investigators up to the new nursery. Charles appeared in complete control as he pointed toward the envelope on the windowsill. How had he kept himself from ripping it open? Even now, with police present, he refused to let anyone touch it until a fingerprint expert could examine it. Not until after midnight was the envelope brushed, revealing nothing but a useless finger smudge. A state trooper sliced open the envelope and handed over the note for Charles to read. Dear Sir, have fifty thousand dollars ready. Twenty 
fifty-five thousand dollars in twenty-dollar bills. One thousand five hundred dollars in ten dollar bills one thousand dollars in five dollar bills after two to four days we will inform you where you were to deliver the money we warn you for making any ding public or for notify the police the child is in gut care indication for all letters are sing sing nature and three holes the signature was unusual two blue overlapping circles inside the oval shape created by the interlocking circles was a solid red circle and a square hole had been punched through each part of the design three holes in all Charles looked around at the grim faces crowded into the room. The note had warned him not to call the police, but he'd done so before he'd read it. Would the kidnappers hold it against him? Could he keep the police from interfering? Nothing he decided must prevent him from paying the ransom. In the depths of the depression, $50,000, about $850,000 nowadays, was a fortune but it was worth every cent to have his son back Wednesday March 2nd 1932 the next day as police searched the house and grounds a massive manhunt was getting underway beyond the Lindbergh's property Agents from the Bureau of Investigation, it would not be called the Federal, Federal Bureau of Investigation or FBI for another three years, along with the Secret Service, the Postal Inspection Service, and even the Internal Revenue Service were put on the case. They joined the New Jersey State Police, as well as dozens of detectives from New York City, Trenton, New York, Newark and Jersey City, the Coast Guard monitored the nation's waterways and the Assistant Secretary of War placed the entire U.S. Army Air Corps renamed from the previous air service at Charles's the disposal. As if that weren't enough, the head of the Boy Scouts of America called on its current and past members, almost a million men and boys, to keep a close eye out for the toddler. The head of the American Federation of Labor did the same, urging its members in the New York, New Jersey area to form search parties. So vigilant were AFL members that they searched not only woods and fields, but also hotels and boarding houses. They even stopped 
baby carriages on the street. Radio stations repeatedly broke into their scheduled programs with updates as well as a description of the 20 month old and the front page of every newspaper in the country carried a photograph of the baby one re wrote one reporter the world drops dropped its business that day to search for the Lindbergh baby Despite all these resources, Charles decided to take control of the investigation himself. Drawing on the same single-minded determination he ha that had got him, gotten him across the Atlantic, he, re he resolved to remain level-headed and methodical. He had conquered the sky. He could conquer this. This, It was easy to assert his authority. The newly f formed New Jersey State Police had practically no experience in kidnapping cases. Most of the troopers had done little more than write speeding tickets awed by the presence of the greatest hero of their time they naturally looked to him for direction schwarz cop too came gave charles free reign charles appeared so confident and sure who could doubt his competence charles turned the house into the investigations headquarters within hours a 20 line search switchboard had been set up in the th in the th three car garage manned around the clock by policemen it rang with tips along with crank calls from people who just wanted to hear their hero's voice anyone who sounded reasonable was patched through through to charles hundreds of false leads came in but he insisted every one be followed up more police sifted through the mall through the mail Starting the day after the kidnapping, about 700 letters a day poured in. As with the telephone calls, no reasonable sounding lead was ignored. Every scrap of information was reported directly to Charles. Well, hundreds of police officers went in and out, tracking mud over the carpets. The ground floor was turned into a sort of dormitory for them, with blankets and mattresses strewn across the living and dining rooms. In the downstairs hallway, tables were set up for the mountains of sandwiches being made and delivered by Betty Morrow's staff. At Next Day Hill... Charles did one more thing that that day he called his banker a partner at JP Morgan and asked him to secretly gather together the ransom money meanwhile Anne stayed out of the way sequestered in her bedroom she wrestled to remain calm, focusing on the comforting fact that Charles was in charge. She trusted him completed completely, had given her baby's life over to him.
If he couldn't bring little Charlie home, who could? Mid-morning on the day after the kidnapping, Anne dragged herself to her window and looked out. Having heard the news, crowds had begun to stream into the area, bringing traffic along the narrow country roads to a standstill. Not to be t deterred, the curious hiked through woods and adjoining farms to the Lindbergh's estate. As they did, they trampled underbrush and left trails of footprints, cigarette butts, and trash obliterating any clues that might have existed. Unable to get near the house because of the police guards, they settled for having their pictures taken beside Charles's car, now parked in the driveway to make room for the switchboard in the garage. Meanwhile, a private plane roared above, giving passengers an aerial view of the crime scene for just $2.50 a head. And then there was the press filling the grounds around the estate with newspaper reporters, photographers, newsreel cameramen, and radio commentators. One news service assigned its entire staff to the story, completely ignoring the rest of the world news, including reports of a war between Japan and China, and Congress's attempt to repeal prohibition. Another news organization fitted out to ambulances with temporary dark rooms so photographs could be developed as the vehicles raced, sirens screaming back to the news office where the photos could be rushed into print in the ne in the three weeks after the kidnapping the New York Daily Mirror a tabloid would provide its readers with 160 foot Photographs, diagrams, and other illustrations. Another tabloid, the Chicago Daily News. more than 200 even the venerable New York Times would run as many as eight articles a day on the crime and if any especially riveting disclosures emerged between a paper's morning and evening issues. Special editions were hastily printed 
and hurried to newsstands. Every facet of the crime, as well as the irresistible glimpse it provided into their hero's private life, Fascina fascinated the public in 1932 the darkest year of the depression the Lindbergh baby kidnapping took their minds off their own troubles troubles But America's obsession went deeper still. Millions were struggling to keep their families together, which for many was impossible. That year, 20,000 children were left in New York City orphanages alone by parents who were unable to feed or shelter them. And little Charlie's separation from his parents Americans saw a grim truth. If heroic, handsome, wealthy Charles Lindbergh couldn't keep his family safe, who could? Recalled one reporter, little Lindy was everybody's other baby or if they had none, their only child. Kidnapped? The Lindbergh baby? Who would dare? And they claim... clamored for every detail of the case. At a time when most people had to scrape together the two cents, it caused to buy a copy of the New York Times newspaper sales rose to rose 20% resulting in a huge windfall for publishers who'd b been hard hit by the depression Lindbergh the Lindbergh kidnapping meant big profit Thursday, March 3rd, 1932. The police had not turned up any feasible leads. And even though Anne insisted Charles was acting like a general managing his forces with terrific discipline but great judgment, nothing was under control. The truth was, Charles had no idea what to do. Behind his Facade of confidence lay a desperate father. Schwarzkopf offered his opinion about the case. The crude ransom note, 
he said, along with the abandoned ladder and the lack of any quick payoff, pointed to a gang of amateurs. In fact, he believed the kidnapping was an, it's, an inside job. It seemed obvious that the kidnappers, knowing they couldn't get past the guards and fences at Next Day Hill, had decided to do the job there. And he believed someone, probably a servant, had helped. Schwarz Kopf had per asked permission. Schwarz Kopf asked permission to interview everyone who worked for the family at both the Hopewell House and the Morrow State Estate. Charles put his foot down. The servants, he insisted, would never betray him in that way. He was confident his instincts regarding people were impec impeccable. He knew Betty Gow and the others were good and decent. He would not allow police to humiliate them with prying questions. Besides, he had another theory, an underworld attack, an underworld gang. Just that morning, he'd read a statement, Mos mobster Al Capone had made to the press from the Chicago jail cell where he was being held for tax evasion. Capone claimed one of his own gang members had planned the kidnapping. He offered to recover the baby in exchange for his freedom. Charles called Secretary of the Treasury Ogden Mills. Could anything be done about Capone's offer? After promising to look into the matter, Mills sent for Elmer Iray, the head of Treasury's intelligence un unit. The same U unit that had caught and jailed Capone. Ire met with Charles that same afternoon, methodically laying out his reasons for not believing the gangster. Capone doesn't know who was the ch know who has the child, Colonel Lindbergh. Iray concluded, he is simply trying to get out of jail. Though Charles wasn't convinced, though Charles was convinced it wasn't Capone, he still believed his son had been taken by the mob. What he needed was a person with first-hand knowledge of underworld criminals. Someone who could negotiate with them minutes after Iray left. 
he picked up the telephone and asked his Wall Street attorney, Henry Breckenridge, Breckenridge to find him a gangster. Friday, March 4th, 1932. It took Bre Breckenridge less than 24 hours to locate one Ricky Mickey Mickey Rosner Mickey Rose Mickey Rose Mickey Rosner a New Jersey bootlegger con man and sometimes stool pigeon by the afternoon Rosner was sitting in the Lindbergh study claiming he had Definite proof mobsters had stolen the baby. Could he get in contact with them? Charles asked. He desperately wanted to pay the ransom. But the kidnappers hadn't provided any information about how to do that. Rosner assured him he could, but it would require the help of his associates, a couple of hoodlums named Salvi Spatel and Irving Blitz. Irving Blitz. Rosner had close ties to crime syndicates. And he and his associates could act as go-betweens. He was ready to open up negotiations with the underworld, he said. And guaranteed the baby's safety. Incredibly, Charles not only gave the gangster $2,500 for expenses, but also moved him into the Hopewell house. Installed in the study, Rosner slept on the couch at night and pretended to make sure, make phone calls to his intermediate intermediaries <laughs> during the day he repeatedly assured Charles that it would take just a little more time to establish direct contact with the kidnappers frustrated that he hadn't been consulted by about this move Schwarzkopf was helpless to stop it. He knew Rosner and his associates were nothing but petty thieves preying on Charles's naivete. His doubts growing about Charles's leadership, Schwarzkopf. now gave the okay for one of his lieutenants Arthur Keaton to quietly begin questioning the Hopewell servants. He ordered his men to review even the vaguest anonymous tips and to once again search the property for clues and he gave one of the troopers Manning the switchboard, the covert task of listening in on the Rosner's telephone calls. It was time, Colonel Schwarzkopf decided, to defy America's hero. Saturday, March 5th, 1932. Just after breakfast, Charles and a young attorney named Robert Thayer 
joined policemen in sifting through the day's mountain of mail. Suddenly, Thayer gave a shout. Inside a plain white envelope, he'd found a letter bearing the kidnappers' unmistakable signature. Breckenridge Schwarzkopf and several policemen gathered around as Charles read it aloud. We have warned you no to make any ding public also notify the police the note began because of all the trouble charles had caused they were raising the ransom price to seventy thousand dollars why had he gotten the whole world involved the kidnappers demanded now they would have to keep the baby for a longer time until everything is quiet there were no directions on how to exchange the ransom for the child although they claimed it was in gut health he was in gut health the message changed charles's demeanor the first two days and wrote he looked like a desperate man i could not speak to him I was afraid to, but with the letter's arrival, he became buoyant and alive. The baby would be returned. Baby would be returned, he believed. He believed. All he had to do was make the right moves and play fairly. And then days passed without another word.